Good afternoon. I'm Jason O'Dell, if you don't know me already. Thanks for uh, showing up today and taking a little time out of your um, your Friday afternoon. So we're going to talk about the eclipse today. Uh, we got this big uh, eclipse coming up in uh, on Sunday, weather permitting, of course. So today I'm going to show, try to present kind of what I know about doing this. And, um, you know, it's always a work in progress. But uh, let's go and take a look at um, what's uh, what's happening here. Hopefully you guys can all see my screen right now. And uh, so this is how to photograph what we call the super moon eclipse, blood moon, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's coming up on, on Sunday evening, depending on where you live or early um, uh, Monday morning. So I'm going to talk really briefly. We'll keep this um, as concise and compact as I can. Uh, we'll talk about when you can see the lunar eclipse and what equipment you're going to need. I'll talk about my exposure settings, camera settings, focus, that kind of stuff, and then try to give you guys some creative ideas as to, um, you know, things you can do if you've got if you've got time on your hands to kill. And again, weather permitting, I'm supposed to get clouds here in Colorado, so we'll see how that goes. All right, so when are you going to see the eclipse? Well, the good news is from, you can see from this photo here, this image, that you can see the eclipse pretty much in most of the Western Hemisphere. So all of North America, all of South America, these white areas, even up here in the UK and parts of uh, Portugal and Spain, you'll be able to see the eclipse. And for those people, if you're somehow tuning in for way out here, you'll be able to see a partial lunar eclipse. Um, it starts at 9.36 p.m. That's Eastern time. So um, the thing about lunar eclipses, though, is that they happen in real time, no matter what time zone you're in. So 9.36 p.m., um, I'm in mountain time, for example, so that's two hours earlier. So that means it'll start at 7.36 p.m. for me, um, and that's on Sunday evening. So we got a full moon. It coincides with the full moon, and uh, you'll just have to check out where the full moon is. Now, where is that? It comes up on the eastern horizon, and then it's going to be rising through the sky. Now, uh, if you're in the eastern time zone, that means the moon's going to be pretty darn high in the in the sky by the time the eclipse kicks in because it's going to be going up um, it'll be almost overhead and the moon travels from the um the east to west through through kind of a this time of year the the southern part of the the sky now that the that's when the eclipse starts you might not notice it because it'll just be slightly dimming uh you'll get full totality starting around 11 41 through through 1243. So for about an hour, again, that's Eastern time. So from, you know, depending on where you're at, um, those of you on the West Coast, you'll have a, a little easier time um, staying awake, but it's going to run through early Monday morning. Uh, it'll be fully uh, total. And then the moon will start to pass out of the Earth's shadow uh, beyond that. Now, if you want more info and get specific times and information, you can go to space.com has got information on this. Timeanddate.com has information on this as well. You type in eclipse, you know, your location, it'll, it'll tell you when the peak viewing times are. So you want to take a picture of the eclipse. That's what we're here for. That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, so here's the question. What do you need? Well, I always use my DSLR. It's got the best, um, you know, resolution. I happen to use a Nikon D850, but, you know, any DSL, DSLR will work. And the reason why I like DSLRs for the moon is because you can set manual exposure and spot metering and things you're going to want to be able to use when you're actually taking these photographs. Um, you're going to need a pretty long lens if you want the moon to fill the frame. So 300 millimeters is just starting to get you in the territory uh, of large. I'll show you that in a second. Um, and then a good tripod and either a ball head or a gimbal head. Now back here I've got, and I'll show this in a minute, um, my tripod set up with a, a Wimberly gimbal head. It's super easy if you're using big lenses like a 500 millimeter or a 600 millimeter lens. The other thing you're going to want to use is get yourself one of these remote cords or one of these little infrared remote triggers um, if you can if you if you already have one uh, that way you can trigger the camera without jiggling it because with telephoto lenses especially high magnification you are going to your camera is going to pick up any kind of vibration so a remote release is really important so 
to get the idea of why you need such magnification and you know some people will actually use telescopes and you know spotting scopes and that's that's cool too it just can be a little bit challenging uh, this was an image i captured of the full moon um with the 600 millimeter lens plus a 1.4 teleconverter so this is and that white box shows you the frame this is an uncropped image of the moon here so this was captured on a on a 35 millimeter format digital camera so you want to call it full frame whatever but a a, a 35 millimeter sensor 600 plus 1.4 so 850 and you can see see that the moon still doesn't fill up the entire frame unless i crop in so the more magnification you have the better um, and that's why I recommend using uh, a good telephoto lens. What about a teleconverter? Can you use a teleconverter? Sure. Just remember that if you're not using a good lens in the first place, the teleconverter could degrade your image. Uh, even though it's going to magnify the image, it's going to magnify optical flaws. Um, it's going to, and and you're also going to lose uh, aperture. So with a 1.4 teleconverter for example you lose one full stop of light so you put a 1.4 teleconverter onto an f 5.6 lens you're now shooting with an f8 lens that's going to have ramifications for your exposure settings later on okay so here's the trick when you're shooting the moon it's really hard uh it, it's not really you wouldn't think it's that hard but it can be hard when you're shooting with a telephoto lens and that's because the apparent motion of the moon this moon is going to be moving through your viewfinder especially if you're using that long telephoto lens so you're going to want a tall tripod uh, because your camera is going to be pointing straight up that means your viewfinder is going to be down below um, it it makes it easier to aim the camera if you've got some kind of gimbal head but by no means is that a requirement and and um, you know unless you want to overnight yourself one it's a little bit late to be getting one but one thing that I really like to use, and one reason I really like my D850, is because it's got this tilting, articulating LCD. So when I'm in live view, I can turn on live view, and I can see what's going on, and I can use that to compose the shot. I'll usually use the viewfinder to try to get the initial acquisition, and then I'll then I'll use live view. Um, to sort of just watch the moon as it's going through the the frame and then i can make small adjustments with my gimbal again the gimbal head makes it much much easier and this live view option is great but the other thing is that the moon's moving fast through the frame and it makes exposure with any of the auto exposure modes really tricky so the auto exposure modes include program aperture priority shutter priority or any mode where you're using auto ISO where the camera's ISO gets chosen automatically. The, depending on your metering mode, depending on the scene, um, that moon moves out. Let's say you're using spot metering. All of a sudden, the spot meter is no longer on the moon and your exposure settings are going to change drastically according to your meter. So I like to use manual exposure mode when I'm shooting the moon. Let's talk about that for a second. Um, and before I talk about exposure, let's talk about focus really quick. Um, autofocus works great. Um, and I, I practiced this last night using both live view focus and regular focus. Um, but one thing that can sometimes happen is when you're trying to focus on the center of the moon, especially if you're using live view focusing, which is a little slower, um, sometimes the focus can miss because there's not a lot of contrast on the moon itself. You're shooting the full moon. So if you move your focus point especially with live view, over to the edge of the moon on the disc and you focus on that edge, you're going to nail focus uh, a lot easier. And live view, again, works really well. You can use live view focusing. Once you're focused, what you can do is um, set your camera or the lens to manual focus. If your lens has that AM switch on it or if your camera has the, the AM switch um, or even tape down 
the the lens with a piece of gaffer tape. If you've got some uh, gaffer's tape, you set it to manual focus, put a piece of tape on the ring so you don't accidentally bump the lens ring. Because once you're focused on the moon, you're good to go. It's not going to change its relative distance at, at, that, at that point at all. So um, what I do on my camera is I've got my camera set up to use the um, AF on button. So once I'm not, and so unless I'm pressing the AF on button, a half press of the shutter won't cause my camera to focus. What'll really drive you nuts is if you go to half press the shutter and you don't have the moon, you know, framed up properly, your camera then tries to autofocus, it misses, it's hunting, and then it gets blurry. So easy solution if you're not set up for back button focus, go ahead, switch to manual focus once you've got that lens focused. If you're using live view, you can even just zoom in on the screen, check the focus on the screen. Um, use manual focus override, it works great. The um, thing about live view, just as a precaution, it will drain your battery down. So um, keep in mind, it's gonna be cold out there. You may wanna have a spare battery if you're doing a lot of live view shooting or if you're doing, you know, if you plan on being out there all night. So let's talk now about the exposure for the moon. Now, the full moon's an interesting, an interesting creature. It's it's actually what's called a sunny 16 exposure. So if you know the rules of exposure, sunny 16 says I can shoot one over the ISO at f16, and then for any uh, reduction in aperture, so that's f16, you you uh, have the exposure speed. So let's say you're at ISO 100 which is the base ISO for a lot of cameras. That means you could shoot one one hundredth of a second in F16 and get a proper exposure for the moon or pretty close, it'd be, it'll be middle toned. Um, what I like to do is generally set the exposure to two thirds to plus one stop above, you know, add exposure compensation or if you're using manual exposure. Um, so the easy way to meter the moon, if you wanna do this and you have patience and you're using a telephoto lens where the moon fills enough of the frame, um, you know, so you can get a good uh, spot on it, is use the spot metering mode on your camera. So if you're on your camera, so again, on my Nikon here on the, on the, the top here, there's, I don't know if you can see that, but there's the little button that has the metering modes. And if you press that, um, I can dial through and there's one called spot and it just has the, um, there it shows it on my LCD. It shows the little the little center dot. Now, depending on your camera, that center dot is either going to be the centermost autofocus point, or on Nikon's, for example, it's linked to your active autofocus point, including Live View, which is pretty cool. Um, totally different uh, animal. So you can move your autofocus point onto the moon, set spot metering, put your camera into manual exposure, and then you can just dial in the one stop above the metered value. What that's gonna do is it's gonna make the moon a little bit brighter. And if you're capturing in RAW, you can always decrease the brightness in RAW, you'll get a better quality data, you'll have less noise. The rest of the frame is gonna be pitch black. So the auto exposure modes don't work great for the moon unless the moon really fills up the entire frame. Okay, so um, the other thing about the moon is that you're using a telephoto lens, and the moon is going to have a parent motion. It's moving across the sky. So, you know, unless you've got your camera set up on a motorized equatorial mount, which is a story for another day, most of us don't have those, uh, you're going to need to track the moon manually by adjusting it. So because the moon is moving, you need to make sure that you're not using really low shutter speeds. And by really slow, I mean, you can get away with about a tenth to an eighth of a second and still capture the moon. Um, anything slower than that, anything, excuse me, anything slower than, a, than about a second, you are gonna get blur, you're gonna get motion blur, you will not get sharp shots. So normally, when I was out there last night taking photos of the moon just to practice, and practice is a good thing, um, try to get a 30th to a 60th of a second. On a regular full moon with no eclipse, that's pretty easy. It's gonna be very bright. So I had my camera set to 64, you know, ISO 64, um, F8. I could still get, you know, 50th of a second, no problem, very easy. Now, the other thing you wanna do with your exposure is you wanna attach this cable release, if you've got a wired one, or use the remote. Um, 
And even if you have a remote, another cool trick, this is going to prevent the camera from being bumped. You know, you press the shutter, it jiggles everything, and it takes a while for that motion to stop. So what we're going to do is if you go into your uh, camera, uh, look in the, the menus, look in the manual. Nikons have this feature. It's pretty cool. It's called exposure delay mode. Um, and there it is, exposure delay mode. It's, it's called uh, custom setting. Uh, D5 on my D850. So it's in the D custom setting group somewhere. Exposure delay mode allows me to dial in um, anywhere from a 0.2 to three second delay with this camera. Other cameras, you might be able to set it for a half a second or, or one second even. A one second delay means you press the button or release the shutter and you're going to be able to, um, uh, the camera will wait for a moment while before it takes the picture. So it introducing, um, basically it's like mirror lockup. Um, in live view, on some Nikon cameras, there is a preference um, where um, you can use, I forget where it is, let's see. In, the, in some of the newer Nikons, like the D850, the D, D500, there's an option for electronic front curtain shutter, which is really cool too. It, it helps to reduce vibration from the, the shutter. So it'll open the mirror in live view. The mirror is already locked up and then the, the front curtain, uh, the shutter is actually open and then it doesn't jiggle the camera again until it actually physically closes the shutter. So that's a, a cool thing too. So all of those things help reduce jiggle, shake, blurriness, exposure delay mode, cable release, electronic front curtain. It's up to you to go into your camera manual and see if your camera has those features because obviously I don't know every camera out there. Now what about during the eclipse? The moon is going to get dark. Once we get into that zone of totality, so around 9.30 p.m., um, you're getting it very dark. So here's a photo that I captured in 2010 during the December 2010 uh, eclipse. I, I had to boost the ISO all the way up to like 4,000, 8,000 just to get a shutter speed of around, oh, let's say a tenth of a second. All right. So the cool part, though, is that you can see the moon's going to turn very orange. That's why they call it a blood moon. It's, you know, the nickname of this. So when the moon is approaching totality, the exposure gets really tricky because if you expose for this brightest part of the disk, the, the remaining part of the moon is gonna, gonna look very dark. It's gonna just look like a crescent moon uh, just because of the exposure. There's not enough dynamic range there. Um, if you expose for the dark part of the moon, this white area is just gonna blow out. So it's a, it's a tricky situation until it goes completely total. And then you just have an, a solid orange disk. And that's really cool. But here is where you wanna boost that ISO all the way up, keep going up so that you can get a shutter speed of, of around at least a tenth of a second or better. Hey, with today's cameras, ISO 6400, ISO 8000, those really aren't a big deal. They do not produce a lot of noise. Um, and what noise they do produce is pretty easy to clean up in post-processing. So let's talk then finally about some creative things you can do. Um, Sometimes, you know, if you're fancy, uh, you have two cameras and two tripods. So there's there's two two common things that ways that people shoot the eclipse. You can you can do the sort of continuous, you know, you you periodically take take shots of close-ups of the moon, which is you know normally what we do. But the other thing you could do is if you wanted a more of a wider view, you could set up a camera with something with a shorter lens, like a 200 millimeter lens, something that's gonna still have the moon relatively large in the frame, but not um, completely, um, you know, but, but fairly small so that it's gonna move across the viewfinder. Now, doing that takes a little planning. You gotta set it up right. Uh, you're gonna have to project where the moon is gonna be in the sky. So this is where a practice run can be tremendously beneficial. The wider your, your angle of view, the better. The exposure setting is going to be really tricky too because you're going to want to make sure that you're exposing again for the moon and not for the rest of the scene. So you want to use those manual exposure modes. But if you've got an intervalometer, 
which uh, for interval timer shooting and most Nikon DSLRs have these built in. It's a, it's called um, interval timer shooting. So I go into my uh, menu here and um, in the photo shooting menu, um, there's this option in the camera menu It's called interval timer shooting. Okay. And you go in there and you can set these intervals and what it allows you to do is it will just take one photo every defined interval of time. So maybe every 10 minutes, maybe every five minutes, you take take a photo or five to 10 or even 15 minutes and you just set this up. And as long as the moon stays in your viewfinder um, over the course of the, the shooting, you, you can end up with a series of images that are all framed identically and the moon's gonna move across the frame. And then what you can do is you can combine those images in Photoshop with layers and blend them together using layer masks and create one of these composite fo photos like I've got here on the right hand side of the of the screen. So let me just quickly show you the uh, rig that I've got set up for my um, for my eclipse right where for the moon uh, that I was doing last night. So I'm going to turn off the uh, screen sharing for just a moment. And what I'm going to do is um, hopefully switch my uh, audio here to to my microphone okay i hope you guys can all hear me because i need to stand up for a moment and show you some stuff so move my chair out of the way so this is what i was talking about for shooting the moon push this out of the way here so i've got a nikon D850. This is the Nikon 200 to 500 millimeter zoom lens. It works great. I also have a 500, you know, big 500 f4 lens. Those are those are good too, um, but obviously a lot more expensive. The only real advantage of the of the the bigger lens is that it's faster. It's an f4 instead of an f5.6. So I could put a teleconverter on that one if I wanted to get closer. So I've got my D850. Um, and I'm shooting it in actually DX crop mode because I'm, I'm still producing a 21 megapixel image or so. Um, if, if you don't have that, no big deal. If you've got a DX camera or APS-C camera, that's great. You get that 1.5 uh, times angle of view. So your 500 sort of works like a 750 millimeter lens. So this is, I don't know if you can see this here, this is my... Wimberly gimbal head. I most often use it for bird photography, but I can balance this really easily and it will stay put. I can adjust the height of the gimbal uh, so that I've got the center of mass more or less uh, equal with the, the balance point. So I'll have this set up. I'll, I'll raise my tripod, obviously. And one great thing that I will do is that I'll flip out the LCD, turn the camera on here, and then I can just in live view mode, I can just compose, you know, set my exposure manually. I've got a histogram that can come up. If you want to see how you get the histogram, check out my uh, YouTube page. I've got uh, tips on how to activate the histogram in live view on the Nikons. It's pretty cool. But then I can see the histogram, so I know I'm not, you know, totally blowing out the exposure or anything like that. And then you get the moon in there. And uh, then I can lock everything down use my remote and just take the picture periodically and I can monitor the progress of the moon. And when I need to adjust it, I've got this nice two axis gimbal and I can just, you know, make, make those fine adjustments. So it works really, really well um, for this kind of astronomical shooting. If I were to set up a second camera, I would have another tripod with a shorter lens, like my 70 to 200 and get that wide view maybe shoot it around, you know, 70 or 100. And that works great if you're somewhere where you've got some kind of foreground, something pretty like skyline buildings, um, just something interesting where you'll get that. Unfortunately, I don't have anything terribly interesting here, so we'll just have to see how that goes. Okay, let me come back into, into view here and put on my good mic. All right, so I think we're back. Technical fun, trying to do all these fun things together for you here. Um, if you really are interested in learning more about the eclipse, um, there's lots of resources out there, but if you wanna take more 
night sky photos and you're interested in things like Milky Way, star trails, you know, shots like this, I do have an ebook available on my website. Um, and I've got a promotional coupon running for 10% off of it right now. If you just enter in Blood Moon uh, when you go to purchase it, and that's available on my website. That coupon is good through the eclipse, so it ends on uh, at midnight on January 20th. Some more resources that you've got, though. Um, you know, there's a lot of information out there. Um, my book, particularly, it's it's printable, and it it talks a, mostly about star trails, uh, less about the moon because the moon's kind of a one-trick pony, unless you've got an eclipse like this, in which case it's it's pretty cool. So that's out there from my website. And then um, just so that you know, I've got a few things upcoming. Um, Sunday before the eclipse, um, you know, if your weather is socked in and you want to learn more about Lightroom Develop Module, I've got this class coming up um, on Sunday evening, 5 to 8 Eastern time. So it still gives you a good hour to go out there and, and get set up for, for your eclipse shooting if, if that's good. And then I've got a couple workshops coming up. I'm going to be doing bird photography. I've got a, uh, I'm taking a small group to do bird photography in San Diego. So if you're in California, you want to learn about bird photography, that's in February. I've got a trip to London and Paris that I have openings for still in April. Um, and if you like these online things, but you don't like to, you know, you'd rather ask me questions directly about your specific uh, needs, I do online mentoring all the time and just contact me for an appointment. So, um, that's that's what's out there today. I appreciate you guys all coming, and I'm going to open it up for um, for questions, and um, see where we go from there.